Share my share my screen. I should probably do that. Here, I'm just gonna show the whole. I will there mute go. myself and I'll try to keep volume down when I go to speak. <laughs> you could do whatever your little heart desires. But yes. Well, I don't want your videos to just be like this baby screaming in the background. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, welcome to round two of Art for Babies taught by a dummy. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, layer modes and how they affect color and a bunch of other stuff. Brushes, brushes in general, the stuff that you draw with. And then we're going to go over the actual drawing part, or at least starting the drawing part of like sketching. So. Layer modes, as you could probably, hold on, see in this corner over here where your layers are. If you go over, show it this rainbow, where it says normal here, there should be something that looks like this in most drawing programs. If you click on it, see there's a whole bunch of, of stuff to pick from. And normal is what just makes the color normal. So let me bring up, I, I, I prepared these beforehand. <laughs> um. So normal, obviously, is just normal colors. And then dissolve, uh, it changes like the gradient. So like, hold on, this part here, this part here, where it's all like faded out, it makes it dithered. So it's made out of dots instead. I don't quite know a good use for this, truth be told, but it exists. So we have to admit that it's there and must have a purpose. Multiply is, wow, it looks really cool. What I use when I am shading a piece, it essentially just uh, makes that color, black is not the best option, makes that color over top, but just darker. Uh, and you can even set your brush to these layer modes as well. So you can set your brush to multiply. And that's what makes it just darker each time you make a stroke, which is really fun, but does it have to be the same color, or is it any color, like how? Any color. So I can do this, and then this. Grab, uh, actually, this. So obviously, if you look over to the color wheel, when you go to a darker color for multiply, it's going to end up coming out very, very dark, almost black. But if you go to white, you'll see that nothing happens. But that white is still there. So multiply takes what already exists and makes it darker, but white is essentially like there's nothing there, so there's nothing to make it dark, which is kind of nice if you wanted to like... This is an example I use because I know it's happened to me a lot where I'm sketching something and I somehow I accidentally click and it joins with the background so that the black is on the white and there's no like layer distinction. I can set it to multiply and suddenly all that white goes away one is an example and I can like color in my my drawing as if it never existed so it's helpful for that and it's helpful for shading but we'll that we'll get to later but then like really really light colors are very very faint and then deep vibrant colors are like black basically color burn is it's almost like in a more intense version of multiply it like makes it very uh i, I want to say black and white like there's there's a hard line between the colors there's no like blending or fading it's just like very aggressive <laughs> with how it wishes to make them darker Linear color, linear burn, excuse me, looks a lot like multiply. There's a little bit of a difference, but uh, not too much. Darker color, I'm not going to lie. I don't know what is happening right here. I don't, I ignore a lot of the, a lot of these, the color burn, the linear burn, the darker color. Lighten makes the colors just lighter over top and like a little transparent. Screen. I does the same, but it's more, uh, just a little more dramatic, a little sharper. 
Color dodge is sort of like the dodge tool that we talked about, where it makes things like incredibly saturated and incredibly bright very, very quickly. Linear dodge or add, because I will say I know that in Clip Studio Paint, it's not called linear dodge. I think it's just called add. And it's sort of like a screen. It just, it, it makes things very, very bright, very, very saturated nearly like burning your eyes and the lighter color is uh, I don't know it's doing some weird stuff overlay I use a lot this is what I use whenever I'm highlighting something this is not really showing a great use of it here but usually it makes things just like a little brighter doesn't work on black obviously. A lot of these aren't really gonna affect black much because it's the darkest color and it doesn't want to lighten very well. But it just makes things like bright without like scorching the color or hurting your eyes too much. Soft light is like a very soft light. Haha. -ha. <laughs> it just makes the color just a little bit lighter. It's quite nice. It's very gentle and soft, obviously. Hard light makes the colors uh incredibly bright and vibrant. Let me see if I could just like grab a color. Oops, this brush is still on multiply. That's why. <laughs> it's not uh like as how would you say? It doesn't make like these colors are very very vibrant, so of course they're going to come out very very vibrant with like any of these layer modes. Uh but it usually makes the color pretty stark. It doesn't look that way here, but vivid light <laughs> really kind of cranks up the saturation and the contrast by like a lot so I don't typically use what is it? it's vivid light linear light pin light and hard mix I don't really use that much either I'll use overlay soft light and hard light linear light sort of the same as hard light there's not really much of a difference Obviously, as you use these, you're going to find a little bit more differences as, as you mess with like colors and stuff and application use. Pin light just kind of does almost the same thing. And then hard mix is... It, it doesn't allow like any like fade that much. It's like everything becomes like solid blocks of color. Like, very, very little, like, blending or fading out. So, I think difference... I think it makes, like, the negative of that color. So, see how the red... This would have been the red up top. Now it's, like, bright blue. Uh, and this, I think, is where the that bright blue was beforehand. It just, like, inverses them. Which actually makes this part look really cool. Exclusion is sort of the same, from what I can tell. Subtract, oh, I'm trying to remember. There's a way to describe subtract as in, like, you're subtracting color, which doesn't make too much sense. In the sense that in digital art, your RGB is your primary colors, because uh, it's made out of light, it's not made out of pigment. And in order to make light be all different colors you use RGB red green blue and I think this is essentially subtracting those channels from each other to make it darker which is like some it is kind of ends up being almost more mathematical you ready to worry about that color I use for let me try to do something really quick color applies literally the color to the piece. So we used it a lot when we were first starting out where I have like a orb. This guy even got like a little highlight. And I make a layer and I set it to color. Let's say it's gonna be red. And I'll clip it and then like it applies that color in terms of like almost saturation and hue to it. So it's really, really good if you are gonna do like black and white art, which uh, we can eventually way down the line go about uh, rendering a whole piece in black and white and then coloring it just like this. That's a whole thing. 
that's not what I wanted. I wanted to delete that. Thank you. <laughs> Color and then Lumosity. Lumosity sucks. It doesn't really do what I, you would think it does because you would think it would make the color lighter based on whatever color you picked. So if you made it yellow, it would be like a brighter yellow. And it just it 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 just kind of makes it kind of shitty. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's just, it's not good. Um, and then, we'll go back to normal. Wanted to talk about if you right click on your layers. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. And a lot of it isn't super applicable. Uh, a lot of it is kind of not really important or you can find it elsewhere in your program. The most important thing that I like to use is either merge down when I want to combine my layers or the create clipping mask layer, which if you click it, it makes it so whatever is on this bottom layer, you can draw on. So for instance, we know that this top rainbow crosses this whole top border of this piece, but we can't see it because only this chunk of the of the bottom rainbow is showing. So if I were to end up doing something like this, regardless of what color I'm using, <laughs> well, <laughs> I can make a pretty rainbow. And then obviously where it ends is red again. So like, I use this a lot for when I'm coloring a piece, which we might touch upon at the end of today, we'll see. Because I already forgot what I'm going to talk about next. I remembered what I'm talking about next. Never mind. <laughs> um, I have like a bunch of things buzzing in my mind all at once. It's fine. So that's our layer modes. They're super, super helpful. But it's with a lot of these, of course, it's sort of you have to figure out what they do for yourself and find out how you like to play with them as you play with art in general. Like I know a lot of people who really don't like using layer modes or they use it for the very, very end of their piece when they want to make things like that final pizzazz, you know what I mean? The, the, the finishing touches, the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the the pizzazz, as I like to call it. But before we get to the pizzazz, we gotta get to the art. And I wanted to talk about the kinds of brushes that you can get with any art program. There is no uh, limiting to any of them, as far as I know. A lot of art programs allow you to make your own brushes, download your own brushes, find them. You can buy them online, which is just the internet in general. You should just look them up. But... Like, this is one of the brushes that I use the most often. It is a brush that, I think this one I edited. I changed a brush that already exists to make it so I like it more for me. What does that mean? I don't know, but you'll find out when you draw. <laughs> There's going to be a time when you draw with a brush. You're like, this sucks. I hate the way it works. And I hate the way it feels. And I don't like it. And then you'll noodle with stuff and be like, all right, well, now I do like it. Why? You'll just know. It's it's sort of just preference, which is just art as a whole. But the thing I like about this brush is that it's got a lot of texture, which is really, really nice. I like texture. I like seeing brush strokes in a lot of my pieces. But it like it fades out really, really nice. Like it's not very like harsh edged at all. And I can make it really small and then I can like it's good for liner. And then this is for anyone who has a tablet, or who uses Photoshop, I should say. If you hit the Alt key, I think it's is Alt and right click while you have your brush. Alt and right click and you drag from side to side will make your brush bigger and smaller. This was a huge lifesaver for me rather than like going over here, making it a little bigger. Maybe that's not big enough. Well, that's too big and like noodling that way. I can just do this. But as you can see, I have I have a lot of brushes. I think it's great to use like as many as your heart desires. You should never restrict yourself to one because there's always something that is gonna be like kind of a pain in the ass to draw and you don't want to draw it out by hand. So like for instance, I made myself a nice like chain brush. It's not the best and there's definitely better ones out there. But like I really don't want to draw chains. 
especially for like jewelry and stuff because it ends up being so small that my teeny little hands would get so tired very very quickly but I also made like a string bead one I made this star one so the possibilities are truly endless with beer brushes like if you can think it you can probably find it and or make it like you can even do like lace you could do a whole heckin lace brush which I, I use these a lot because they're such nice like detailed things the one I think is really really important so I gotta go down I gotta I gotta, I gotta go find it my mess of brushes but nope wait oh here we go now I don't remember where I got these these might have come from Lightbox actually which is like a uh, an artist convention but they have this one person it's Devin L. Kurtz plant brushes it's all plants because if there's one thing I really don't want to do when it comes to a background <laughs> is plants I mean they can be fun but to get them to look nice is like kind of a pain sometimes. Plus why would I do that when I can just do this? Is it a total replacement for drawing brushes period? Probably not. Sometimes it's nice to do something like this and then to just take another simple brush and like just add a couple of your own little spiffs. You know what I mean? So it's not a total replacement but it's supposed to help the process. To help it go a little quicker for you uh, and also help you not get carpal tunnel or hurt your hand or anything like that because god we don't want that so take breaks take them often uh, stretch your wrist out or stretch your arm out one other thing for sketching and drawing is that and I'm definitely a uh, a sinner I, I break this rule a lot is that when you draw your lines it helps to draw how do I describe this without like turning on my camera and showing you? You're supposed to draw with your arm, not your wrist. So you're supposed to like lock your wrist up and when you make these big strokes, just move. Draw a little guy actually, hold on. <laughs> this is a guy, he's drawing. Let's say he's left-handed. <sighs> got his hand on his tablet. He's having a good time in his little seat. Anyway, instead of drawing with your wrist like this, which is, this is a bad excuse, but you should draw with your arm or your elbow. Essentially just like draw like that instead. <laughs> and it seems silly and it's a uh, it is it definitely feels kind of silly but it saves you so much in the long run because otherwise you're like death gripping your pen and just moving this joint over and over and over again while like this ends up locking up and so does this it's just it's not great and it's not good for you and maybe eventually i'll show like a couple stretches but also the internet exists and you can find them there too um but for brushes i don't know how you can do it in Clip Studio Paint. I'm pretty sure that at like if your brushes are listed here there's like a little wrench icon in the corner and you can edit your brush that way or at least the settings for your brush. I don't know if you can edit the brush in totality itself there but for Photoshop anyways it is I'm trying to see what it's called brush settings it's like a little brush with the three dashes by the side and you have a bunch of stuff to f uh, <laughs> fidget noodle with. So I'm trying to think where to start. They all do sometimes pretty minute stuff. Otherwise, it's like kind of drastic. For instance, like spacing. It takes the pattern of the brush, like the individual stamp shape, which is hopefully you can see that on screen, and spaces it out. So it's like, oh, very spaced. Or you can smash them together. Oops, actually. And then they become like one more congruent shape. 
And also, give me one quick second, because Lapis just texted me, and I want to see if she wants to come join. We lost one. <laughs> we, we lost Galaxy. And then there were two. <laughs> <laughs> Although I know Galaxy will be back. So there's the spacing, and then there's also size up top, which I think just changes what default size when you when you select that brush. So that's not super important. Uh, flip X and Y. Obviously flip the brush X and Y. And then this circle here sort of dictates how squished it will become. So like instead of being, oops, that nice shape. Now it's all squashed, which it's kind of nice. <laughs> and you can pull it back out. And then you can change the... Di di not the direction per se, but which way it's rotated. When you start... Actually, put that back. Put it... Put it back. So that's just basic using the brush stamp. Shape Dynamics is sort of taking it another step further of like oh, welcome welcome i'm you're, here you're I'm late here. i'll be quiet <laughs> we're talking about brushes and how you can change them modify them etc etc so size jitter essentially instead of it being just like this one shape all the time or one size all the time you can make it so that the more jitter you have, the more randomization you have. So like some of it is, oops, some of it's bigger, some of it's not. Put that back in. And the control, I think, is like, there's more if you push down. I'm not sure what the other ones, I just used the pen pressure one. Angle jitter is basically the same as the size jitter, but it just changes how often the brush is rotated as you draw. I don't quite know what the roundness one is, so we're going to ignore that one. Scattering is, I think this dictates how far away it becomes. Oh god, yes. Uh. <laughs> so obviously the, the brush typically follows that like one line. The scatter essentially pushes it away from that line to varying degrees. Texture, I think, I don't really mess with because I don't quite understand how it works. It's essentially taking your brush and taking another image or texture pattern and putting it on top and sort of like putting them together in a way I don't totally understand. Dual brush is also the same but with another brush. Color dynamics can be fun. I know some of the plant brushes do this but they essentially, like if I pick green uh, and I put up the hue jitter, it essentially will start to change like what hue every time I draw. Like the more jitter obviously like the crazier it's gonna become, so that's why this orange is here. But if I keep it down low, it should just just you know, these are obviously none of them are the same. So they just change a tiny bit. I think the saturation is essentially the same but with saturation, so Super vibrant, super vibrant, and then these get all muted. Brightness is the same. So those are those can be really really fun to play with. I use them specifically with where where are me where are me stars. I don't think you can see it super well. Unless I get rid of it. Do, 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 do. I know one of my star brushes like changed color, but you get the point. Do, do, do. So, don't want that, don't want that. Transfer. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know what that is. And a lot of these are pretty minimal. Uh, noise, wet edges, build up, smoothing, and protect texture are stuff you can't necessarily like edit. It's just you turn it on or turn it off. So noise, I think just... I think you have to be like really zoomed in, but it's supposed to put noise on it, whatever that means. Wet edges gives you like a bit of an edge to your brush. It makes the brush like almost transparent. Sort of like 
paint. It's supposed to be more similar to paint. Build up. Doesn't really look that much different, truth be told. And smoothing and protect texture. I don't, know. I don't know what that means. I keep I'm hitting save out of habit, which is something you should definitely pick up to save frequently and save often. Uh, I don't have this saved because I know it's gonna end up being nothing. And that's what. But because I'm so used to hitting save, that's why you keep seeing that screen pop up. So don't mind that. <laughs> don't look at that and don't look at my files, please and thank you. I am perceiving. Please stop. <laughs> Put your fucking eyes away. So now we're going to talk about... We're going to talk about sketching in general. So, Kilo brought up this last time, and I thought it was a really, really fantastic subject. But at the same time, it's it's very, very broad. And there's not necessarily a right way or wrong way to go about it. But I figured I would talk about the couple of ways I know that artists sketch and how they do them, sort of. If that makes any sense. <laughs> so there's there's two prominent ways that I can think of when artists sketch and it's just straight up you sketch your thing and then suddenly that's your line art or you, you, you sketch and then you turn it down and then and then you ink which is where you go on top and you make it really really nice nice i used to do inking a lot and now i find that i don't like to do it and i don't like my art when it <laughs> when i ink things god damn it um a lot of artists like swear by it i think it's great for me personally what happens is when i sketch and then I ink, I feel like I lose a lot of my pizzazz and expression and like motion in my art. And I don't want that. So I'll show you, do like a quick doodle and show both. So I like to just sketch and go right into it and then clean it up. So what I'll do is to, typically, I'll take a brush. And then I just, I'll, it's kind of chicken scratchy and I'm not using a very, very big brush. You shouldn't use a big brush to start with. Because you don't want to end up like really locking yourself into any details right away. You want to get the idea down. So I use a big brush. And you erase big, big, it's big and bold. So big smile. Something simple. I'm really feeling the Bob, the Bob Ross vibes suddenly. <laughs> There's no mistakes here. Just... You gotta give him a little friend. Uh, wait, hold on. You got a little bird friend. How about that? The bird's happy too. <laughs> Aww, no, that's sweet. Okay, so uh, this is all I'll sketch, and so now that I've got my idea down, I don't turn the transparency down or the opacity down. I'll just zoom in, and I sort of take my eraser and I sort of just start carving away until my lines get a little more thin, a little more refined, and a little more the way I want them to be. I'm cleaning up as I go. Maybe adding a few more details. Just sort of. I'm carving away. I'm whittling right now. I'm whittling my, my hood. <laughs> maybe I'll redraw a few lines here and there. To get them to be really, really nice. Like maybe that this angle right here looks pretty bad. So then I'll just redraw it. That neck isn't right, so I'll just redraw that. Sometimes the like the nose, for instance, like that's not how I draw noses at all. But like it's a placeholder. I know the nose should go there. So then I had a nose. You draw noses on people? Sometimes. Not all the time. <laughs> draw the eyebrow. Carve that out. Draw a little face. And obviously this isn't done, but I'm going to call it done. 
because if I if I start doing any more of this, I'm gonna end up zoning out and then not talking, and then I'll the the piece will be finished, <laughs> and I'll be like, whoopsie, it's been two hours. But then use my lasso tool to just adjust stuff, get it just the way I want. But then that's one method. That's the way I do it. It's not. I don't know if it would technically be quicker. I guess it is because you're just kind of going right to it. Uh, but this saves my wrist a lot of time and pain and just makes me not so stressed. But the other way the artists typically do it is they take it, uh, their sketch, and however rough or loose it is, and they turn the opacity down. They grab a new layer and then they go in and then like meticulously sort of trace over top. To get like super crisp, clean lines, like the first time. Get a little burb in here. He's so happy. He's so cute. What? They just keep going, and then I know that some artists, and this is more style preference than anything, will take their line art and they like ah, uh, it's a good example, like where the neck, this line meets the chin, will make this like a little thicker and a little, a little darker like that, where anything else meets together, they'll just make it a little thicker. To give it some like some pizzazz. It's all about the pizzazz. You've gotta make your own pizzazz. Another best friends. <laughs> that you came out bad. Oh god. The pressure's on. Boop. There we go. And then they have like super super clean line art that they can immediately Oh god, go into coloring. Boop. Oh wait, actually let me really quick just slap in another eyebrow. <laughs> uh and then let me check how long. Alright, it's been a half hour. So we can do a little bit more. Actually, I just want to say that was magical. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I went into a hypnotic state. Wow! <laughs> I got the magic. <laughs> I was gonna say, I guess before I continue anymore. Sorry, I took a sip. Does anyone have any questions about any brushes, sketching, etc.? Anything unrelated? Yeah. Um, as um. <clears throat> someone who may not be well versed and may have missed part of this session what would you recommend is the best beginner brush that would um uh, not look as like pixelated i think that's the right word because i notice a lot of times when i'm like like i have a huge canvas mm -hmm. uh, but i'm still using like a little like i think it's called like a studio brush or something mm -hmm. and after i export it the thing still looks a little pixelated i'm not sure if something that's a me problem or um... it could be the canvas or your dpi because despite having a big canvas if your ppi isn't big enough especially when you export that image it will get crunchy and ppi is as a quick refresh from last lesson how about that <laughs> ppi is pixel per inch I usually work at 300 to 350 ppi, um, and that essentially is pixels per, per like square inch. So if I, I wonder if I'll, it'll show up because this is uh, white. Probably not. Hold on. Let me just quickly. Yeah. And then if I zoom all the way in, <laughs> we can see all the individual pixels. So if you have a really really low ppi, it's like. I showed an example of it in the last episode where I had a really, really low PPI image and I was drawing on it and it looked just like this. Like, it looks totally fine. 
but then I upped the image to a higher PPI, about 350, and while everything did become blurred, it's because there's so much more space for the image to take up. It can like flow through so much more of these little itty bitty pixels. But I know that there's sometimes for Photoshop it starts you off with like a I have a pixel brush, it like ends up looking like if I make this really hard. Like it has this sort of look to it, that like very pixely yeah. jagged edge. And it's like I don't I don't want to look like I'm drawing in Microsoft Word, god damn it. I wanna look like a art person. So you it depends on the program. You'll probably have to either most programs offer other brushes, but you should be able to also find other brushes. I used to, excuse me, I burped for a while, just use the Photoshop standard, like the hard brush. It's, it's like super nice because it's, it's just a round basic brush, but it's not like harsh on the edges. I mean, it looks a little harder when I zoom in like that, but in comparison, let me go grab him. I grabbed the wrong brush, that's why it looks the same. I was like, uh oh, my example went out the window. Where's my pixel brush? Come here, you. You scoundrel. Yeah, like you can see, like this looks super hard and this is like a little nice and softer. Where's my hard brush? And the nice thing is with, I'm, I don't know how this works with other art programs, but there's a thing called hardness, and that essentially like makes it really, really hard, so the edges are pretty crisp, or if you make it soft, it makes it like feathery. You can like airbrush, gently grace the canvas. You can really Bob Ross it with this. <laughs> I think it's a, the hard, just the standard circle hard brush is probably a good place to get familiar with all the, the things a brush can offer you. Otherwise, you can easily find free brushes online to kind of pick apart and get used to and play around with, which is always like super, super fun. I, for a long time, thought I would just stick with one brush. I didn't think there was a point. I really like that one brush, and then I'm like, I just, but look, it's so fun. Like, it's it's a whole, like, other playing ground. And then, before anyone asks any other questions, and then I forget what I'm talking about, at the very, very top, we talked about the symmetry tool that's up here, but there's this other one. If I hover over it, does it actually have a little thing? Yeah, this is always use pressure for size. This essentially, so before... It's a circle. It's always a circle. It always stays the same circle. When I turn this on, it takes it so that the circle gets smaller. This is, of course, if you're using some sort of pen to draw with, it makes it so the circle gets smaller as I lift up my brush or you don't push down as hard. And that's good for... Like, I use it... I, I don't use it that much. Unless I'm using it for like, like an eyelash. I feel like it's good because it's pointy at the end. It's fun and it has its uses. And the other one up top, I forgot. This I think does opacity with pressure. So if I press really hard, it's dark. But if I press not so hard, it's not so dark. And then this one, I'm actually not too certain what it does. But to answer your question, go find a circle brush. Go make a circle brush or go online and go have some fun and finding some really wild and weird stuff that you can just canoodle around with as long as god dang it as long as it's not that pixel brush but if you're still having issues with different brushes then it could be uh your canvas or some other third thing that i'll have to help you out with separately <laughs> Any other questions? Do you want to be brush related? It can be anything related. Okay, I feel like I'm I'm pushing the room here. Um, you don't have you don't have to ask anything if you don't want to. 
No, 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 no. It's, it's, I just don't want Kilo to be like, he's taking my time. But I forget. <laughs> um, he should have he spoke up. Uh, it's true. So, with some arts I've seen on the interwebs, I've seen uh, some artists have lines and some that do not have any lines at all. Mm-hmm. I was wondering, like, how do you do? How do you do? How do you do? I don't know how to phrase that. How do you do do? How do you do? do you, well, like, yeah, like, I, does that make sense what I'm saying? No, it does. Because, like, okay, cool. e- even my style when I paint it, there's still some semblance of lineage to it. I think I know what style you're talking about. Let me just get rid of these. And it's like, uh, uh, let me let me draw an apple. So you're talking about like, oops, like true, like lineless art. That's not what I want. There's no lines. I'm actually gonna. So my thought, and I'm not the best because I have not. I I don't practice this art style. I do not partake, but I would assume it would help to do everything in separate layers. So like, one is the apple. And this is the leaf of apple. And then you could even do another layer and make the stem of the apple. And then... I think most people, this is the route, they go to this little square here that locks the pixels, so like I can't draw outside this apple. They could either, because I know some people do a very like blocky lineless style where they sort of just make everything out of big shapes and like that's it. Or they could end up like blending everything together. I'm just sort of like guesstimating because again this is an art style I don't subscribe to so I can't for say for sure how they do it but I can certainly guess boop, boop. This is my apple to make everything super blocky or they end up just like essentially taking the layer of just that one area and sort of blending everything together and like take it and they just sort of like eh, mess around muck not muck I shouldn't say that but just like go nuts but just to inside I would I want to say if you're looking for tutorials or more art that follows that specifically I would just look up I guess lineless art tutorial unfortunately because I don't know or don't part I don't practice it it sounds weird when I say it like that when I don't do it myself it's kind of hard to say like exactly what they do whoops Oh boy. But that's my that's 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 my interpretation of like lineless lineless style. Of course like as you draw and as you look at references and as you look at other people's style, like you'll st- st- start to understand how they do it and start to find your own sort of niche on how you do it specifically cuz that's, I guess, also sort of just developing your style as a whole, which comes with time. And I recommend you actually don't try and find out your style right away, that you learn the basics. But it's really, really hard to not want to try and find your style right away. But uh, it will come in due time, for sure. I hope that answered it enough. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I think it just takes practice. I think at this point, and practice research, finding other artists who do it, and either asking them or like doing master studies of their art. Which a master study is essentially 
looking at someone's art and then going, I'm going to try and recreate this, like, stroke for stroke. And then just sort of trying to figure out, like, all right, how did they get this line to be so crisp? And, like, how did they get this color and stuff like that? I, master studies can be a ton of fun if you're really invested in someone's style and how they really accomplish something. Um, I typically don't like to post any master studies because they look like someone else's style and you're purposefully replicating their style. It's just like, it should be just like sort of a you thing, if that makes sense. Like, you don't need to go to the world and be like, hi, I've I've become a mimic and I'm, I'm like replicating this person's style because they might not take too kindly to that. Makes perfect sense. All right. And then with that, I think we've hit our mark so we can open up the floor to anywhere questions, any topics that we want to start covering for next not next week, next next week. Obviously, we'll start to go more into like sketching and drawing as a whole. But if there's anything else that you want to hear about, that's I was gonna say sort of in the same vein, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. Just yell at me and let me know. I guess not. <laughs> but send message by a pigeon. Send a message by a pigeon. Leave a comment down below because this is going to be a YouTube video. <laughs> like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Um, if that's it, well, then I got nothing else to say but <laughs> Bob Ross music here. Thank you so much for coming by today. I hope you enjoyed your time and I hope I'll see you next time. Have a good night. Do, bye bye. Do, 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 have do, 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 <laughs> bye bye. Have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> this video was made possible with the support of my patrons. Five dollar ghoul shout out goes to Lapis Dragon 01 and Kelly. Special shout out goes to my twenty dollar demon tier patrons, Mimi Chai and Jay Lops. See you guys next time. Bye.